Wait, what episode is this? Oh yeah, 48. Let's do this. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello, welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enoch Bartlett Sears, and I'm your host here on the Business of Architecture show, where we talk about running a better business so you can focus your energies on creating great design and not having to worry about where the next client's going to come from or how you're going to end up paying the bills. And on the note of paying the bills, a great way to start is to have a solid business plan. If you're a business owner or thinking of going out on your own, I have a question for you. Do you have a business plan for your business? Well, the Architect Business Plan Competition is intended to foster a dialogue about the importance of entrepreneurship to the future of the architectural profession. The competition is open to registered architects in the U.S. or Canada who have considered starting a design firm or who are operating a design firm for five years or less. There's no fee to enter, and the registration deadline is March 28th, so to find out more, head on over to architectbusinessplancompetition.com or businessofarchitecture.com forward slash plan. And for those who decide to enter this and want to have a go at creating an architect business plan, I highly encourage it because there will be some free group coaching that will help you get your business plan written and edited. So if you've been thinking about doing it, now's the time. Go through it with a group of people. Get it done. Go over and check out architectbusinessplancompetition.com or businessofarchitecture.com forward slash plan. Oh, yeah, one more thing. There will be a $10,000 first prize and a $2,500 second prize. And I know that there isn't a lot of entrance at the moment, so you have a pretty good chance of walking away with a $10,000 check to help you start or improve your business. So once again, go check it out and let me know what you think. Today we have our second half of our conversation with Bob Fisher. He's a principal at the Greenway Group, a strategic marketing management um, consultation firm. And Bob is also the associate publisher of Design Intelligence, which is a publication that sends out you have you have uh, a number of things. Well, I mean, you can probably explain it better than I can. So, could you tell us a little bit about your organization and your positions? Sure. Um, so, the people that uh, saw the earlier part, this will be a bit of a repeat. Uh, but there are really three components to our organization. Uh, the first is called Greenway Group, and we're a management consulting firm that specializes in working with uh, design-based companies, uh, especially firms that design for the built environment. And we provide a whole comprehensive uh, set of services there. It could be uh, helping with ownership transition. It could be uh, leadership identification and development. It could be uh, uh, helping firms develop a better financial model. It could be uh, developing um, sort of firm-wide or uh, marketing strategy. Uh, it can be helping set up a business development program. It really depends on, on what our clients need. So the second component of what we do is a think tank called the Design Futures Council. And that's a multidisciplinary think tank that's made up of, uh, of leaders in the profession who get together uh, periodically throughout the year uh, to figure out how the environment is changing for, how the business environment is changing for uh, built environment design professionals and how all of the members in that organization can go back to their firms and and better navigate that changing environment in order to uh, in order to thrive. The third part of our business uh, is called design intelligence, and that's the thought leadership and research component to what we do. Uh, it's really the the journal of the Design Futures Council, and a lot of uh, the thought leadership is contributed from there, or research ideas, or um, you know a lot of the information comes from uh, members of of the design of the Design Futures Council. And all of those help to, to reinforce what it, what it is that we can offer uh, firms that we consult with. You say that as part of the Design Futures Council, you discuss, and uh, it's multi multidisciplinary, as you said, and you're discussing the future of the industry and how the business landscape is changing. Well, right. What are you seeing in terms of changes? There are a lot of changes, and you know the general areas of change are not probably going to be uh, much surprise to your audience, but one of the 
you know, one of the big drivers of change is technology uh, throughout the whole design and delivery process. And one of the biggest things that we're changing is um, what what our what our managing principle calls a, a smushing together of the the different stages and roles in the traditional design and delivery process for uh, for architecture projects. So we're seeing uh, we're seeing those kind of changes. Things are speeding up. Uh, it's absolutely necessary for all the all the parties to be at the table earlier, to cooperate sooner. Um, you know, it, we're, we're starting to see, uh, let's say, general contractors are starting to offer more design services, and they're sort of changing their models that way. There's a lot of changes going on out there, uh, and the, the software that's used to, uh, to design and the software that's used to communicate uh, is all a, a big challenge for firms, you know, adopting that kind of stuff, keeping up on their expertise, and the financial investment, all of it. So there's a, there's a lot there's a lot going on. And the other thing that we're seeing is we're seeing a lot more savvy clients, which is really good if you're talking about something like sustainability, uh, because our our clients report that the clients they're designing for are much more um, much more attuned to issues of sustainability and they're much more demanding about that they're demanding that their that their projects uh, perform better they're demanding less waste uh, in the delivery process and the in the construction process uh, and all that ultimately is um, all that ultimately is a challenge in the short term but really good news for a lot of firms who share that passion for uh, for protecting the environment and, and practicing sustainable design absolutely I mean I'm excited about it Oh yeah. So last episode we talked about we took a hypothetical situation and we said, you know, if we have this 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 practitioner or group of practitioners who want to start a firm, sort of what's the initial process they go through? And we really honed in on just trying to fill a need in the market. So a market based mm -hmm. approach as opposed to these are my skills, I'm gonna go out there and see if I can see if I can find a market for my skills. Right. So this episode we talked about going into a little bit of the value and mm -hmm. the communicating of that value. Now, Bob, you said something. I'd just like to quote you here, and, and you can correct me if my quote is a little bit off, but basically you said that architects in general are not aware of their value. Sure. Could you expound yeah. on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, you know, my view is, is just my view um, from what I see, but so much of the way that architects are trained and so much of the way that uh, many architects look at the world uh, is is really focused on their output. It, they, it's really focused on the designed environment or the designed object. And you know, you think about critiques and how that experience was all the way through through your training. Um, there's, it's it's very output focused, right, as opposed to outcome focused. Which has more to do with the way that uh, the way that a building or an interior space um, has an effect on the owners and the users of that of that space. So you know, an architect designs something, it's built, and then it starts to deliver value over the entire uh, useful lifetime of that of that building, right? So you know, a well designed a well designed building, a well designed space. Uh, is going to have a positive impact on numerous levels for a client organization or in the case of a residential, uh, you know, the, the person or the, the family that lives there. So a lot of times, you know, when we try to talk to architects about what effect they know that their design work has on the users of a space, they kind of come up short in their answers, and I, I'm, you know, my concern is, or my um, my hope is, really, uh, that they come to know the extent of their contribution, so that they can start to build a value proposition for their firm around that. Mm -hmm. When you say that they come up short in their answer, could you give me an example of that to help me understand it? Okay, so you know, I was having a, a conversation uh, the other day with a sole practitioner who is looking to uh, to grow his business now he's been he's been in practice as a sole practitioner uh, and had 
a few staff members for a while uh, before the economic downturn uh, for probably a dozen years now. And uh, when I started to ask him about, well, what is it about what you do uh, that makes you the, the obvious choice for a client that's considering you versus, uh, versus somebody that you compete with, somebody who you compete with. And he talked a lot about um, basically architectural, architectural features, architectural you know, uh, aspects of architecture, that his, his architectural design work that he felt made it superior to what other people could do which is great if you're talking to another architect who speaks that language or if you're talking to one of the very rare savvy clients that speaks the language of design. But what, uh, what came through in that conversation to me was that there was this whole, um, this whole dimension of positive impact and value that he was delivering uh, to his clients who were residential clients that he was not able to articulate. And uh, really, if you think about think about being in the position of someone who's going to uh, to hire an architect, right? If you you know if you do happen to be one of the very small percentage of clients who is uh, savvy about architecture and has the ability to see great design as opposed to merely good design, uh, that that's you're going to be a very rewarding uh, client for an architect to have and things are probably going to go go fantastic but most of the time you're thinking about whatever uh, whatever your need is that you're trying to fill whether it's a home for your family or whether it's um, uh, an environment for your retail operation that uh, that reflects your brand and helps move your product or whether you're looking for uh, the the design of a hospital that is going to um, improve patient outcomes. You know, if you're designing hospitals, your focus, your focus should really be on how is this built environment helping to improve patient outcomes? How is it? Because that's the bottom line for mm -hmm. for people who are running those kind of operations. They want they want to help people get better. They want their um, their physicians and other healthcare staff to be able to to work more efficiently, uh, to serve more patients, to be able to um, increase the amount of healing that they can do. And there are many architects out there, I don't mean to, to portray this, um, that, that architects don't have a sense of this, uh, that because there are many smart practitioners and firms who really do design for the ultimate effect of what they're, um, you know, what they're, what they're designing, what they're producing. Um, but there are still quite a few people out there who don't understand just how much value they're actually delivering, and they're not able to articulate that. And sadly, they're not able to charge for it because you know they're not fully aware of it. They can't make the, the client fully aware of it, and therefore the client um, the client is making their decision on fees based on an incomplete set of criteria. Okay, so tell me. How would an architect, let's talk just about a sole practitioner, how would they identify the value and then how would they, how would you suggest they go about turning that into the communication strategy and expound that for me? Okay. So if you are user-centered uh, in your design work and if you are designing Basically, okay, let's take, a, did you say you wanted to use a residential architect as an example? That's a great example. Sure, let's go okay. with that. All right. So, if we're looking at if we're looking at residential, um, if you are designing with your primary your primary focus is what is the experience going to be like of being in this space for the people that are going to spend the most amount of time there. So the the owners, uh, the owners, the the people who occupy it, their guests, uh, that kind of thing. Um, that is that already puts you in the right kind of mindset to really deeply empathize with the users of the space and to understand what their needs are and to create something that fills those needs. And if somebody's really adept at this, uh, they can they can also work with needs that, you know, they can work not just with needs that the client can articulate, but also with needs that the client might have but not fully be aware of. And they might be and 
the designer uh, should be able to, to bring expertise to the table that uh, kind of opens up the client's eyes to new possibilities that the client wasn't aware of. Um, you know, kind of a, a side story to this. Um, the world of industrial design and product development is really leading in a lot of ways on the whole field of design research. And so, um, you know, what what you get in a lot of these types of firms and what you get in a lot of these companies that, that produce these products is they have uh, they have interactive kind of experiences that they can take people through that help elicit what the core needs are in the in the target market so that they can go back and design things in a way that serves that need you know the uh, the old there's kind of the old example uh, that I've heard others use is a minivan like nobody knew they needed a minivan until a minivan was there but somebody went to that target market and somebody found out what the unmet needs were and they uh, they took probably took members of that target market through a process that gave them that kind of insight and uh, then was able to create a product uh, that that filled that need it's really not it's really no different um, or, or it, it's very similar and can you know architects can borrow the model and how would that apply to a smaller practitioner that might not have the resources of larger firms to be able to do these sort of in-depth research projects or can they do them? I think they absolutely can do them uh, and the thing is is they should also be compensated for doing them because uh, helping to identify these needs is going to give the client, give the end user something that's far more useful and continues to deliver far more value all through the life of that of that building. So the first question that um, or the first thing that people should should look to do is uh, insist on and make part of uh, the des the design process the right kind of engagement with the client up front, uh, so that you're getting the kind of information that you need uh, in order to in order to create the right design that's going to uh, perform at all the right levels for the client. So. You know, some of uh, some firms that we're aware of, and some of these happen to be larger firms, but there's no reason why smaller firms couldn't do it too if they're um, appropriately compensated for it. Is you know, in in healthcare, as an example, we're aware of a firm that actually puts its architects through um, through kind of uh, um, I guess you would call it mock experiences or 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 play play experiences where they will actually go in and play the role of a patient and be ushered through um, an emergency room and how people are uh, checked into the emergency room and what what did it, they get to see the world from the eyes of the patient and that that informs their design work when then they when they later go in to design a clinic or um, an emergency room or what have you because they understand what this key group of users is is all about and there are other um, you know, there's a lot of research being done out there in human factors uh, on, uh, you know, how how it is that uh, medical staff move uh, in space, in you know, in interior spaces, and how things should be laid out. So, you, if if you've got somebody who understands how those two things work together, they're automatically going to be making something that's far more useful and far more valuable to uh, to their healthcare client, and the next most powerful thing that they need to be able to do is when they when they understand that value and they understand how to uncover it and they work that into their process and they understand how to how to charge for that is how to articulate it through their marketing so that people go into um, a relationship with them understanding the true depth and breadth of what it is that they offer and they're willing to pay for it okay let's let's talk about another example because we so let's say there's a, a firm doing work for a school district, mm -hmm. okay? And sure. I know that, you know, it sounds like what we're talking about here is a little bit like programming, but a little yeah, bit more sure. in-depth. You know, I know that in a typical process, mm -hmm. there's 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 outreach where the architecture firm will meet with the administration, they'll meet with the teachers' representatives, they'll meet with the students, and then they'll try to get like a consensus of 
different stakeholders, how they want the project to go. So that's sort of a typical, I think most nowadays it's it's kind of typical in terms of the programming part of it. How would, you know, with the knowledge you have, how would you go to that process and say, hey, listen, we can tweak this and we can add this and this is what it really needs to look like. Here's ways we can improve that process to make it more effective. Well, uh, one of the key things there is, I mean, it's, it is an essential component of of programming to go in there and talk to the people who are users and try to get an idea of what it is that they need in that way. But again, you run up against this uh, this limitation, which is not everybody knows what they're going to need, uh, or they, they, they won't be able to articulate it to you. There's also the question of innovation, right? So people, uh, people who are using a space, you know, uh, teachers in a classroom or what have you, may have some ideas of how they would innovate their physical space, but they may, they may have needs that could be met in some way that hasn't yet been envisioned, but they're not able to articulate what those needs are. So again, the, the product folks have developed methodologies that kind of go under this, um, this umbrella of design research to help people, to help uncover uh, these unspoken or uh, unarticulated needs that you combine with what you learn through, you know, traditional programming uh, to come up with more innovative solutions. Okay. So how could a firm that's doing schoolwork, how could they apply this in their, in their interaction with their clients? Like, okay. In, like you said, so, for the healthcare, you gave me an example. Let's move it over. To okay. So, so two examples. One would be immersion, right? Uh, talking to people is one thing, but you've got you've got this very mediated version of what the what the need is and what the experience is. But what what about direct observation? Uh, what about actually putting uh, you know use borrow from ethnography, right? Uh, and some of their immersive methods of getting into a culture and understanding that culture. The same thing can be done for uh, or do, done with design clients. Right. The more that a designer understands in a hands-on way, in an experiential way, what the experience is of the users, the more that that designer is going to be able to um, to to understand on a very deep level what it is uh, that that people need and how they need that that space or that that building to perform. Excellent. So, I love so it. So it's you know there's another. Um, is another interesting thing. We were talking about value uh, earlier, and there's a firm that we know of that practices in the Midwest that uh, that specializes. One of their specialty practice areas is in education, and one of the services that they offer is actually helping uh, school districts to do the research necessary to get um, funding passed, uh, and because a lot of these. A lot of these, uh, you know, a lot of their clients are public school systems who have to fund certain projects through bonds or whatever else, you know, levies. And this uh, this architecture practice actually has some really savvy tools and services to help support uh, school districts in that effort, like, you know, researching the the constituencies and sort of building a a strategy for how to how to fund this. And my own experience, working as the director of communications in a um, in an independent in a, in a private school, um, and we were in the midst of trying to raise um, thirty five to forty million dollars to to do this to do the largest uh, capital improvements in the school's hundred plus year history. Well, we were. We were working with a firm that did fantastic design. They were very thorough about, um, you know, the research that they did on all that, which actually gave them a leg up. Uh, they were hired to do, to do the research and benchmarking first, and they had a proprietary system for doing that. And that they were hired as, you know, as part of a separate engagement. Well, that also kind of gave them uh, a, a real advantage when it came time to uh, to look at. Who was going to be the lead architect on uh, all of the different buildings that that had been identified? Well, if I had one piece of advice for this firm, it would have been this: uh, as the director of communications, who was uh, on you know core part of the team that was trying to put the communications together to convince donors to to donate this thirty-five million dollars, 
uh, there was a lot more that that firm could have done to support us. Uh, or I should say there were, there were, uh, when they were thinking about putting this together, very, I, I think, understandably, they weren't thinking about how this was going to be funded. But those of us on the client side were really focused on how it was going to be funded because that was really the first step for us. You know, it's great to have all these, you know, wonderful schematic designs, but if we don't find people who are really passionate about backing the mission of the school and what that campus master plan is, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to build anything. And so I can envision a scenario where that firm that was so smart in the way that they developed the programming could then have offered and been compensated for the kind of support services that we would have needed in order to uh, successfully raise that money. Because one of the things that, you know, that I saw in donors that I was, uh, that was really remarkable to me is how, uh, how excited people were when they saw drawings. Fly-throughs and highly technical things were, were, were fantastic, and those have a persuasive power as well. But there was really nothing that got people inspired about the, the future vision for the school like drawings. And we use them as, as essential props in all of our communications with clients, and, or I mean not with clients, with, uh, with potential donors. And, you know, it... I can envision I can envision a whole suite of services that that a firm would offer uh, in that way, and they wouldn't have to be a huge firm to do it. They would really just need to understand what we as as clients, what we as as owners, were up against, what our priorities were, and design a suite of services to uh, to help support us uh, achieve our priorities, so that we can help them. Uh, do fantastic work and everybody wins. What kind of drawings? What kind of drawings? Yeah, uh, just conceptual drawings. Okay. Uh, and and uh, the more that they looked hand done, the better. I mean, it was really quite remarkable because what it did was, you know, in the early stages when we were trying to develop a vision in the donors' minds for what what the possibilities could be for that school. Um. You know, drawings were some of the most appropriate vehicles because they allowed people to 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 use their own imagination in that vision. You know, it wasn't something that felt like it was already solid and it was already done. You know, a lot of times with uh, when you have donors, they're also the kind of people that have, uh, can provide valuable strategic advice on a variety of different levels. And so, when you go to them and you're trying to to jointly form a vision with them of what the future of the school can be, something that feels very open-ended like a drawing can be a very persuasive tool. Now, that said, uh, one of the things we also did is we put together a really slick video that had all kinds of fly-throughs and things, and it was very polished, and that also had a persuasive power all its own. Interestingly, we had to produce that on our own, whereas, mm. The, yeah, we had to actually <clears throat> mobilize our own resources to do that, and at some cost, mm. that went to another type of firm, because that wasn't one of the things that the architecture firm envisioned as part of its role. So, you know, that to me is a is a missed opportunity, and that to me is, I, I mean, I don't want to uh, say anything negative about this firm. They they did fantastic work. Sure. There were just all of these opportunities that came to my mind where they could have helped us. And it would have been worth us paying them, and we ultimately wound up paying other people. So, uh, you know, that's another thing that that people uh, might want to think, uh, or uh, that's another reason to look at um, to look at really starting with your owners and starting with your users, starting with the core needs are, whether they're articulated or not, and that comes from a deep and empathetic understanding uh, of of the clients and of the of of the owners. And uh, kind of building out what your offering is from there, because it may um, there may be tremendous opportunity in offering a complementary suite of services uh, in addition to uh, traditional architecture and design. Hmm. Interesting. So we're talking about different profit centers, and I find that fascinating. Yeah. You know, I, I just McDonald's comes to mind. 
just mm -hmm. you know hate or love their food but in terms of pure marketing and pure business efficiency I mean they have it mastered and I'm just thinking that you know when you go in there you have the happy meals and you have they're they're promoting movies you know but what is what is watching a movie have to do with eating a hamburger you know so it right. seems like they've been able to apply that they said okay we have a captive audience here what are some other additional services that we can offer them to well and, and let's not forget real estate because they uh, they they are a very large real estate holder uh, and that's a significant uh, source of uh, source of, of their their wealth as a company and they're very savvy about how they do it when I was in the uh, entertainment industry you know I worked for Cartoon Network and we had a variety of different streams of income uh, one of the first ones was you know we were a cable channel so the uh, the more cable systems that carried us uh, and paid to carry us you know that was one major source of revenue Advertising is another major source of revenue. The better your shows do, the more uh, the more you you're carried by multiple cable systems. The more you can uh, charge for advertising. And then there was the whole consumer products area. So, you know, if we had a smash hit show like when I was there, Powerpuff Girls was the big thing. Uh, you know, it was a five hundred million dollar uh, consumer products uh, property. Uh, you know, we had. All kinds of licensees uh, that were that were out there paying us a licensing fee in order to produce a product that was uh, branded with Powerpuff Girls. So, you know, then you get into all kinds of other uh, sponsorships and uh, promotional, you know, joint promotional things. Other businesses do it all the time, and with the changes uh, in traditional architecture practice. You know, archi architecture practices have always had multiple, um, multiple, not necessarily streams of income because they come from one place, but they're charging for different things. Uh, technology is one driver of change in what it is that architecture firms can can charge for, uh, but it also opens up all kinds of opportunities for uh, for alternative and complementary services that that firms or practitioners uh, can offer. And it's opportunity. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that that's it's been a great episode, Bob. And you know, speaking about just to end on the note of the additional the additional services, or shall we say, the additional profit centers. You know, you said when you were in that position as the owner, you mm -hmm. had imagined, oh, here's a slew of things that you could have thought of that this this architecture firm could have included and could have right. added additional value. Can you just throw some of these out there just to get our minds kind of out of our sure. little box? All right, so so um, remember, I was working for a school, right? So it had grades seven to twelve, and we were in the midst of uh, we weren't going to increase our enrollment, but we were building new buildings to to refurbish the campus, which um, you know was was going to add to the to the value that we could offer the students. So one of the things that the firm did absolutely right is they had developed proprietary benchmarks because they worked with a lot of different independent schools and they were able to come in and tell us what we needed. They were able to actually help us know what we needed because we we knew we needed certain things like faculty office space. That was a no-brainer. But when you've got these complex decisions to make as an owner, like where are we going to put our resources, you know, um, if you look at all of our, they had a way that they could look at all of the different programs on campus and measure um, measure our space allocation against uh, comparable comparable schools, comparable institutions, and give us an idea of where we fell uh, compared to other options that were out there uh, for parents who are looking for an education for their kids. So that was fantastic, right? And uh, that actually, I think, again, I, I suspect that they don't, they don't know how important that was to us and how valuable that was to us because that benchmarking that they provided us enabled us to go to donors and start to demonstrate a need. You know, hey, we've already, we've got a great school, we're giving a great education, but take a look at how our built environment, how our physical space compares to peer institutions. Here are some places where we really need to make uh, to make some changes. You know, do you agree that there's the first step, of course, in getting somebody to to support a capital effort is you got to get them to agree that there's an issue. And this firm was able to give us a fantastic tool to do that. 
right? So that's one. It's an extension of traditional programming. I could see opportunities where they could have done that in different ways that might have uncovered other needs that we weren't able to, to articulate. Some of those methods we talked about earlier, whether they're immersion type things or taking people through, uh, through experience exercises to, to, to try to, to try to get out what these un, unarticulated needs are. You know, there, there's additional opportunity there. So another is think about how your owners have to fund this. Now, residential is one thing, but if you're looking at institutional and if you're looking at uh, doing something for nonprofits, well, they've got to uh, they've got to raise the funds to do this through donation. So, you know, architects are the ones who make the vision real. They make it tangible. Right, so we as an institution might have had some goals uh, that we wanted to get to, but there was really incredible power in being able to show somebody in a concrete way what that vision looked like. You know, we could tell our story, but they let us, they helped us show our story. The opportunity there is if they understood that it was one of our top core needs was to, to, to fund these projects, there's a whole bunch of stuff that they could have done to help us build an even more compelling vision of what, what that school and what that campus could be that we could then take to, uh, that we could then take to donors and have them, uh, you know, have them get excited about that vision and have them uh, be willing to support it. So those are, those are a couple of ideas. And, and again, the main theme is, understanding what the priorities of the owners are and the users and what the experience of the users of the space is going to be in a way that maybe goes a little bit deeper than than traditional programming. Excellent. Yeah. It's an excellent place to, to leave the interview. Great. Bob, how would people get a hold of you if they want to reach out to you or connect with you or find out more about GreenRay Group and about design intelligence? Sure. Well, uh, the online home for design intelligence is uh, di.net, and again, you know, we've got a uh, free newsletter called Design Intelligence Update that people can uh, can subscribe to just by dropping us their email address. Uh, Greenway Group is at greenway.us, and my direct email, if anybody's interested, is bfisher at greenway.us, and that's b f i s h e r. Excellent. Well, thank you, Bob. It's been great having you on the show. Appreciate it very much. It's been a pleasure. And that's a wrap. Thanks for riding along on another show about the business of architecture. I want to know your opinion about today's episode. Visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash podcast or send me an email at show at businessofarchitecture.com with your feedback about today's show. And remember, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free to grab your free membership pass to Business of Architecture Insider, where you'll have first access to free resources to help you run a great business. See you next week. expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you run a great business. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5. Do it anyway.